In this lecture, we are going to discuss the principle of minimum total potential energy, which is essentially a restatement of the principle of virtual work. when the internal and external forces are conservative. So let us start by Um, understanding for a particle what it means uh, for the force to have a potential and why we consider this to indicate that a force is conservative. So let us say that the change in position of the particle is given by a displacement vector u. We know that the total work, virtual work done is F transpose delta U, where delta U is an arbitrary, infinitesimally small virtual displacement, and this is a, an unconstrained particle, so we don't have to, to worry about it. Okay, so now this is the work done by the applied forces on this particle. Very well. So now we are going to assume that we are not dealing just with uh, a small virtual displacement, but with a sequence of small virtual displacements. So this particle is going to move first a small increment of delta u, then second one, third one, and fourth one, and so forth, and so on. And we would like to do, to find the work done over all this sequence of, of motion. So, if the displacements here are u1 and the displacement here are u2, we will see that if the force, for example, is constant, that if we sum the virtual work done in the first step, second step, third step, and so forth and so on, we will end up with the total work done is just F transpose U2 minus U1. So if you start from the displacement U1 and you move to a displacement U2 through a sequence of infinitesimally small displacements, if the force is constant, for example, you will see that W is F transpose U2 minus U1, which means that the work done depends only on the start displacement and the end displacement. It doesn't depend on how you arrived from the beginning until the end. Because if the displacement at this point here, call it U3, call this U4, call this U5, and of course, the number of steps should be very large if we're talking about a sequence of infinitesimally small displacements, but just to illustrate. So if you calculate the work done through the first stage, it's F transpose U3 minus U1. Of the second stage, it's F transpose U4 minus U3. And then you add to that F transpose U5 minus U4. And then plus the last 
step is u2 minus u5, which is the change in position between 5 and 2. And if you sum, you will see that u3 appears with a plus and minus, u4 appears with a plus and minus, u5 appears with plus and minus, so you will be left with nothing other than f transpose u2 minus u1, as we have already expected. So in, that's kind of the definition of the conservative force, that the work done through a sequence of virtual displacements doesn't depend on the sequence on which these virtual displacements were applied. Very well. So, an easy way to guarantee that, of course, F here is just what we call a dead load, which means that it doesn't depend on displacements. But in general, the force might be a function of displacement. For example, if you have a spring and, and you are pushing the spring, the resistance of the spring, the force in the spring, internal force will depend on the displacement and as such, F is a function of Q. So, in general, for a force to be conservative, it can be shown, although I'm not going to go into the details, that in that case, you can write the force as a minus the derivative of a scalar function of displacement with respect to the displacement. So the x component of the force is the derivative of the potential with, the, with, with energy with respect to the x component of displacement. The y component of force is the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the y component of displacement and so forth and so on. If you do that, you will see here that virtual work is nothing other than S transpose delta U, which is minus F transpose, uh, excuse me, minus partial V partial U delta U transpose. So if we have displacement components in 3D U, V, and W, you will see that the virtual work here is minus partial V partial U delta U plus partial V partial small V delta V plus partial V partial W delta W. And what we have between parentheses here is just to first order Taylor expansion of the change in potential due to superimposing delta U, delta V, delta W on the actual displacement U, V, and W. So what you have here is nothing other than a first order Taylor expansion of u plus delta u minus v of u. And as such, we can write w as minus change in total potential due to a virtual displacement, which we call delta, delta v. So, virtual work is just minus the change in total potential. And since total potential depends on, the, on displacement, if we go through a sequence of virtual displacement, the total virtual work will depend only on the start point and the end point. It will not depend on the path 
for the sequence of application of these of these virtual spaces. All right. So this is for the particle where we had only externally applied forces. What about the deformable body? So for deformable body, we have two types of virtual world, which are both in general not zero. We have the virtual work due to external forces, which is equal to integration over the body of B transpose delta U, where B is the body force per unit volume, and integration over the boundary of the body of T transpose delta U, the area where T is the applied surface traction. So for W external to be conservative, all what we need to is to have a conservative uh, volume force, body force per unit volume. So B should be derivable from a potential and T, the attraction should also be derivable from the potential. The easiest thing is when B and T are not dependent on displacement, in which case they are dead loading, and for dead loading, the potential energy of external forces is very simple, because then, since B doesn't depend on displacement, then we can write this as minus D transpose U, dV plus E transpose U D area. Then when we take delta V, of course, delta are changes due to the application of virtual displacement. And since B and T body forces and tractions are not dependent on displacement, then we can treat them as constants. And then we can easily see that W external is minus delta V, which is the definition of the potential. And this is for dead loading, yeah? This is for dead loading. And by dead loading, we mean that it doesn't depend on, it doesn't depend on displacement, and this is the most common type of loading we consider, at least for small deformation theory. So that's the first component of the total virtual work, which is the virtual work done by external forces. What about the virtual work done by internal forces? It turned out that the virtual work done by internal forces, which is our second component, is nothing other than minus integration over the volume of sigma transpose delta epsilon d volume. Or sigma, as we agreed, was a vector, six by one vector containing the stress components, and epsilon was a six by one vector containing the strain components. And these are not really physical vectors, they are more like array, one dimensional array, because stress and strain are in reality two dimensional tensors, they are rank two tensors. Okay, so if we look here, at this expression and expand it, we have, this can be written as minus sigma x delta epsilon x, sorry, plus here since we have minus out, plus sigma y delta epsilon y, plus sigma z delta epsilon z, plus tau yz delta gamma yz plus tau zx delta gamma zx plus tau xy delta gamma xy. D volume. Okay. 
And we want to express this as delta of a scalar energy. So in order to do that, we would like to express this as a delta Fc, where delta Fc is called strain energy function. And it is function of the strain. We know that as a material, that constitutive law of the material is defined as a relationship between stresses and strains. So stresses are functions of strains. So we look at this and we say we would like this to be the variation of a scalar potential. And this energy, since it depends on strain, people call it strain energy function. Sometimes we call it stored energy functions. All right, so if you remember what we had before for delta V, which was the change in potential due to a change in partial displacement. So again, we do the same here. So delta C is nothing other than C. If you have stream epsilon and you add a virtual displacement delta U, this means that you will add to this E delta epsilon. So change, there will be an infinitesimal change in strain due to the infinitesimal change in displacement minus the strain due to the original displacement. And Taylor series comes to our help. It says this is partial C partial epsilon x delta epsilon x plus partial C partial epsilon y delta epsilon y and there will be four more components. So if we look and compare these two expressions here, the one here and the one here, we see that we can conclude that sigma x will be equal to or should be equal to partial c partial epsilon x sigma y will be partial c partial epsilon y and sigma z will be equal to partial c partial epsilon z and of course same for shear stresses, so tau yz will be partial fc, partial gamma yz, tau zx is partial fc, partial gamma zx, which is the same as xz, and finally tau xy is the derivative of fc, which is a stored energy or strain energy function with respect to gamma gamma x1 okay and then we can write w internal as minus integration over the body of delta C d volume, which is the same as writing it as minus delta capital U, where U is the total strain energy in the structure, and it is nothing other than integration over the body of strain energy per unit volume d volume. So if C is strain energy per 
per unit volume and it is the material property yeah and u is the total strain energy in the structure which is the body that we are okay very well so now we have found that the virtual work done by external forces is minus delta V where V is the total potential of external forces and W internal is minus delta U where U is the total strain energy of the structure which is also the potential energy of the internal forces. So the principle of virtual work says that W internal plus W external equals zero and this is our condition of equilibrium and from there we can write this as minus delta U plus V equals zero and minus sign doesn't make any difference so this leads us to the principle of minimum total potential energy which looks like delta U plus V equals zero, which states that the change in total potential energy, which is the potential energy of internal forces plus external forces, due to arbitrary virtual displacements, is zero at an equilibrium configuration. Yeah? So essentially, this is a statement about change being zero. If you remember from calculus, if you have a function that doesn't change, this means that slope is zero. So you have this option where the function would have a minimum, or you have this option here where the function would have a maximum somewhere here. And you have that third option, which is like x cubed, for example, where the function has zero slope, but it's not min minimum or maximum, yeah? All right, so, so the fact that the change in total potential due to small changes or to small virtual displacements is zero, it doesn't necessarily mean that the total potential energy is the minimum. But under certain conditions, and we are going to discuss some of these when we go to the uh, next part of the lecture where we discuss the stress strain relationship, we can show that the principle of minimum total potential energy means that our uh, total potential energy is always a minimum. This will require only that the stress strain relationship is linear and that the strain displacement relationship is linear, which is already the case for uh, linear theory. So if we're talking about small deformation theory, we always assume linear stress strain relationship with some constraints, of course, on the relationship between stress and strain, as we're going to see. 
and we assume that the strains are sufficiently small such that strains are linearly dependent on displacement. And in these cases, we can show if the loading also is dead, yeah, that the total potential energy is indeed a minimum. And this actually is the only case that can happen when the strain and displacement are linearly related. So if everything in our problem is linear, and if we satisfy some fairly general conditions on the stress-strain relationship, then it is always a minimum. And the reason why I keep drawing these balls is that this is the standard explanation of stability. So if you have a small ball in equilibrium and total potential is minimum, then it's a stable equilibrium because if you move the ball a little bit to the right or left, it remains around its equilibrium position. The other two cases are not necessarily stable. So linear theory equilibrium is always stable. And total potential energy always a minimum And this already tells us that if we want to see any buckling at all or loss of stability, we have to take some nonlinear terms into account. And this is what we're going to see when we derive um, plate equations and beam equations from including moderate rotations. And at that point, we will see that stability can uh, is no longer guaranteed. And at a certain loading, you can lose stability. And as such, buckling can physically, can physically occur. Okay.